morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to Tanakh and Psychology, or for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, welcome to Tanakh and Psychology. Um, so we started last week by talking about what does it mean to be a human being, particularly in the eyes of the Tanakh, um, but also in the sense of the, the history of psychology and where it came from. And in terms of, we're gonna do the second one first, the history of psychology, that it has its roots in philosophy, particularly in Greek philosophy, that sense of what is it that makes a human a human, um, that historically, it really wasn't until 17, even 1800s that the idea of psychology as an independent field that that study of what makes humans humans and how they behave and how they interact as being something that's different from philosophy emerged in the 1800s in the historical context of, of social and cultural revolution. And particularly when that social and cultural revolution came up against the strictures of Victorian Europe. And we'll talk more about that next week when we talk a little bit more about Freud that started to cause problems. Um, but basically we said that psychology came from philosophy, which is the more metaphysical aspect of it, came somewhat from theology, which is our perspective, and some degree came from physiology and, and medicine, that it was recognized that the head and the mind had different um, had a different way of operating perhaps than, than the rest of the body. We talked about how in, in the Torah, the idea is that humans were created as a extension of mammals. In other words, they're created on the sixth day. They're the last mammal to be created. They are referred to as nefesh chaya, just like the other mammals are referred to as nefesh chaya, but that there's something qualitatively different about humans, that we are created as a bria, that we're something completely different, almost an, another ex nihilo, another yesh me'ayin, and that that which makes us different is that we are created b'tselem elokim. And the Mephalshim discuss what that means to be b'tselem elokim, but the more or less all agree on the fact that our ability to think, to create, to judge, to evaluate, to plan and make what we call moral decisions or values-based decisions are all of the things that make us different and make us human. What we're going to talk about today is the, the account in Breshit Perik Bet, which differs from the account in Perik Aleph, and look at kind of the first aspect of being human, which is really being in a relationship with an other, whether that other is our spouse, whether that other is, is God, and the foundations of relational psychology or the idea either of having a relationship, that is more than just a relationship that is physically and sexually and genetically beneficial. So that's what we're going to look at today. That's why today's Shi'or is, is titled, I think something, The Relational Human. And now I'm gonna screen share and we're gonna go into the text. And we're going to be fundamentally looking at Breshit Perik Bet. So hang on a second. and. Pull that up. Go here and here is our source sheet. Okay, so, and I, I say relational human and the reason that we have the word HU there in, in parentheses is that I always want to point out that when the human was created in Perak Aleph, number one, it refers to us as Ha'adam, right? That in Perak Aleph, Briyat Adam, right, which we have right here in front of us, was that male and female were created 
the same at the same moment in the same way and that we are referred to as ha-adam, the human, or as a friend and colleague of mine refers to us as the humanoid. And the question is raised, what does it mean, zakhao nikiva bara otam, right? If in Perekbet, which we're going to get to, it seems to be that there's only a male. So some of the mitarshim say that, in fact, yes, pshuto kemashma'o, there was only one human, the male, but that human had the ability, because he had an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, to create both male humans and female humans. So that when it says, on a purely genetic physiological level, that the man was created with the ability to create both male humans and female humans, um, which is an interesting thought. It's one that we are, are not going to go with for the moment, but I want to put that out there that it is absolutely one of the shitot. So we are created in Perik Aleph by Kadosh Baruch Hu. We established that we are created body and something, soul, mind, cognition, whatever you want to call it, um, and that we are given a mission in Perek Aleph. And in Perek Aleph, we are given the mission of right, that our mission is basically to be the top of the animal chain. And the Midrashim that we talked about last week discuss how humans are, are part angels, but we are also in a way part God in the sense that just like God rules, HaKadosh Baruch Hu rules in the Elyonim, that we were created to rule amongst the Tachtunim, because if there was no leader amongst the Tachtunim, it would very quickly descend into a Lord of the Flies or animal farm type of situation, and that the ruler would be solely one based on physical power and not necessarily based on moral and spiritual integrity. Um, but it's very clear that our mission is to rule and to multiply, and then Hashem gives us his bracha. So we leave Perek Aleph with a human being that is a male human, and seemingly there is also a female human. We leave Perek Aleph with a soul and a mind. And we leave Perek Aleph as the human in charge of the rest of the animal kingdom, using the plant kingdom to his benefit, and with the blessing, literally with the bracha from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that, that we have this connection. We also leave Perek Aleph, <coughs> excuse me, with the human as being able to communicate with the divine. We, we, we can't overlook that, that in Breshit, what makes us different than all other animals, all other mammals, is that Hashem can speak to us and we can hear him, right? We don't just obey in the sense of the way that, you know, animals follow their instinct, but that we can communicate with the divine. And that Dr. Gerald Schroeder in his book, Genesis and the Big Bang, refers to these humans, not only as homo sapien, but homo sapien sapien, that we are super sapien, that we are able to think in an abstract way to the extent that the spiritual and the metaphysical and our nishamot can almost leave the physical. So in effect, What's going on in Perek Aleph is not just the creation of the first human, but really what it is is the creation of the first Navi. And we're going to talk about Nebu'ah in, in later weeks. But now I want to move into Perek Bet, which is obviously very different than Perek Aleph and is also the source of you know, documentary hypothesis and two accounts, but we're going to look at it as it is. So Perek Bet, which really begins with with Shabbat, it talks about how Hashem Vayitzer Hashem Elokim et Adam. 
This is in, in an earlier Pasuk one that is not here, that Hashem Elohim, and I think we talked about this last week, but if not, it bears repeating that Hashem is Midat HaRachamim, the Yud, the Hei, the Vav, the Hei is Midat HaRachamim, is the Lemala Min HaTeva, the Midah of Nefs, the Midah that, that breaks the rules of science. And Elohim is the objective judge, the black, the white, the rules of science. And that in Perik Bet, the, the deity that is creating this Ha'adam or is forming this Ha'adam is both Hashem and Elohim. And in the Pasuk, Vayitzer Hashem Elohim et Ha'adam, which I believe is Pasuk He, there's a great deal of discussion already in the Gemara about why we have two Yuds. And one of the reasons that's given for the two Yuds is that it's both the Midah of Hashem and the Midah of Elohim that is creating this human. Another explanation, however, of why we have two Yuds, and this is a more mystical, more Midrashic explanation, is that the original human that was created was created du pao tzufi. And it's the Ramban who brings this, this more Kabbalistic, mystical explanation into the realm of Parshanut, but it is originally found in Mesechet Brachot, um, where Hashem talks, of, where the Gemara talks about Vayitzer Hashem et Adam. Actually, now that I'm thinking, it might actually be Mesechet Shabbat, I don't remember. It was Dafyomi a bunch of months ago. In any case, so Hashem has created this, this human, right, this person that is both merachem and din, is both lemala minateva, something that is extraordinary, miraculous, divine, but also totally physical, mortal, subservient to the laws of gravity and physics and chemistry. And Hashem places this human in, in a gun, right? And then Hashem says that, he, he decrees lo tov heyota adam levado eselo ezo kenegdo. This is the, the in Perik Aleph we have lots of tov, right? Complete. That there is something Hashem says is incomplete about the human, the way he is. And particularly if you want to take a slightly more metaphysical approach to the fact that this was not the only human being walking around. And perhaps this was a human being with two faces, right? That what does it mean there was something missing? So what Hashem says, lo tov heyota adam levado e'eselo ezer kenegdo, right? That, hang on, we're gonna scroll down to those sukim. We have the, the sukim and the gun, hang on. Um, here we go. Lo hiyot, lo What does it mean in ezer and kinegdo? In the most shot sense of the word, it means that in order to be a complete, remember the word tov is complete, right? So in order to be a complete human, and in this sense, we're talking about a spiritually and psychologically complete human not just a physically complete human. We need a helper, but more importantly, we need a helper that can stand opposite us, right? Kineged is that state where it's one facing the other, which is really important that a human being can function with an animal as an aether, a dog, a horse, a camel, egg, an elephant, a donkey, whatever, a water buffalo, that a bee to make honey, right? Humans don't necessarily need other humans to survive, except when it comes to sexual reproduction, right? In order to make an, more humans, we need the opposite gender of the species, but that's it. So what does it mean when Hashem says, lo tov heyot adam levado e'eselo ezer that despite the fact 
that the opposite gender human is enough for our physical survival. There is something incomplete, right? That word tov, which goes back to Perik Aleph, there's something incomplete about us if we don't have a counterpart with whom we can communicate, not just physically, not just biologically, not just sexually in the sense of reproduction, but spiritually and metaphysically. That from Perik Bet, actually from the moment of creation, but that this psychological, spiritual aspect of the human requires a counterpart to share that experience. What Perik Bet, what this Pasuk tells us is that there is something that is foundational in our need for another person with whom to relate and communicate. That makes us, that's another thing that's different. So to underscore this, what the Torah tells us is that the first thing that Hashem did was bring all of the animals to Adam. And Adam looks at the animals, thinks about the animals, very cognitive, understands the animals, names the animals. And we know that in ancient languages, if you think about Native American languages and other indigenous languages, hieroglyphics, that nouns, particularly names, are descriptive. And even in Hebrew, all of our proper nouns, whether they're names or names of things, have to do with the essence of what those things are and what they do, right? The nouns and the verbs in our language are connected to each other. So what Adam does is he looks at all of these animals, he assesses them, he thinks about them, he understands them, he gives them names, but he's not relating to them. He's still alone. He's still missing something. So what does a Kadosh Baruch Hu do? We're now in Pasuk, Kaf Aleph. Vayipel Hashem Elohim tau dema al ha'adam. Right, that Hashem causes a taldema, which is either a physical sleep or a prophetic sleep, based on Brit Ben Habtarim, which is in this week's parasha, and Sefer Yona, right? That a taldema is not necessarily physically going to sleep, but it's some state of being transported from the physical into a different state. And what does Hashem do? Hashem removes a tzela, vayikach achat mitzah la'otav, vayiskob basar tartav. Right? Hashem takes a, a bone. A tzela is not necessarily a rib. Check out the Ibn Ezra. It's some kind of a supporting bone, right? Just like the tzela in a tiva, in a boat, in an ark. It's something that supports the structure. He takes out one of these bones, he fills the space in between, and then what does he do? Vayiven isha, and, and one of the Midrashim here say beautifully that vayiven here actually means that he braided her hair. It means somehow he prepared her for the man, right? Vayiven, vayiven Hashem Elohim eta isha, vayavi eha el ha'adam that there is some kind of process by which Hashem is preparing this creature, this that came from the human, and then Hashem brings this human to the other human. And we know again that Vayavi Eha is, is both, it has to do with, with the physical kind of coming, but also the marital, the sexual, the joining. Right, that, that there's something about this new human that is designed to join with the existing human. And here's Adam's recognition, right? right? He recognizes that this thing, this being, this animal, this mammal, is his counterpart. And he refers to her as Isha, as the female form of Ish. The problem with English, right, is that 
we refer to Isha as woman. And, and Isha is called woman because of the rest of this pasuk, right? Ki me ish lukacha zod, which is then translated into the Latin, is subsequently translated into the German, right? That woman is von man, woman von man, from male. It's unclear amongst many of the Mephashim whether Isha kim meish lukacha zod is in a physical sense or in a metaphysical sense. Particularly if you think about this concept that the original human was du partsufi, had two faces. And what happened, excuse me, is that Hashem actually separated them from the back. That male and female were effectively Siamese twins facing in opposite directions and somehow joined along their spine or along their back ribcage, very different than what we imagine. And that what happened at this moment is that Hashem separated them. And now this thing that was behind Adam is brought around to face Adam and Adam recognizes, oh, this is me, right? But it's a different version of me. And why is that important? because one of the first things that humans have to do, and we'll talk about this in weeks to come in terms of human development, is recognize that other humans, on the one hand, are separate, and that each human is distinct and separate and permanent, yet other humans are still human. So we are totally separate, but we are also alike. And because we are alike, we can identify with one another. So there is an identification here that happens and a very, very deep identification. And we know that it's an identification at the deepest order because of the next pasuk. This word, the vekut, has to do with the deepest form of connection. Atem ha devekim b'Hashem chaim kulchem hayom. That, right, v'davatim b'Hashem elokecha. That what we are commanded to do, our relationship with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, is used with the same language, devekut, yada, right, in perek dalet, v'Hashem yad, v'ha'adam yada et chava, et chava ishto, this idea of the knowing, right, the, the clinging, the knowing, the fusion between a human and Hashem, which happens through the soul, is the same as the clinging and the union and the fusion between a male and a female. That that is not just a physical thing, that it is a, an emotional, spiritual thing. So from the get-go, we have this fusion. And then we have the perfect union, which we'll get back to next week, right? They were both naked. They were equally naked. They were the same. And there was no shame. But we're going to come back to this pasuk next week. So to just take, take a, a pause for a second, um, we have here in the Torah, we have the creation of a separate male, a separate female, two humans that recognize each other as the same, both in body except for their genitalia, but more importantly, in terms of their souls, they are designed to communicate with each other on a physical level, on a verbal level, but also very much on a physical and a spiritual level. So that in Perek Bet, the human that is created is a, a human that is in relationship to another human and in relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What is our relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Earlier mentioned in the Perek, that we are placed in Gan Eden, Le'ovda u'leshomha, that we have to take care of this Gan, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given us a mitzvah, right? Mikol eitz ha'gan tuchal, a mitzvah to say, please go ahead, eat and enjoy. 
right? I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. So our relationship to Kadosh Brampo in Perek Bet is one where we can hear him, we, we communicate with him, we, and we are obliged to him. And we're going to get back to that obligational relationship again next week. Want to move into the world of psychology? Just want to you know, break this up with some pictures, right? So here we have these classic Michelangelo images from the Sistine Chapel of Hashem creating the original human. And then we have a couple of other images of, and, and I particularly like this one here, but about the female. And what I really like about this one, because I always am always reminded there were Jews in Italy. So chances are there were Midrashim already floating around in Italy, because here we see Hashem creating the human, but we see the cherubs, right? That, that like we talked about last week, that the, the angels collaborated with Hashem in creating the human. And then in this image, we have Hashem and an angel and, and Adam here lying and the female kind of emerging from the male. Just some, some food for thought. Okay, if we compare Perik Aleph and Perik Bet, and we've been talking about that comparison, we see that there are some differences in the text itself, that Perik Aleph has Elohim, that Hashem has, that Perik Bet has Hashem Elohim. In Perik Aleph, there's Bri'a. In Perik Bet, there is Yitzira. And that the function of the human is different in Perik Aleph than it is in Perik Bet, which that in Perik Aleph, it is a, a job of rulership, and in Perik Bet, it is a relationship. So this leads to what is known as the doc documentary hypothesis, this idea that if you have two similar stories, that it indicates that there's more than one author, right? We obviously reject this hypothesis, which leaves us to explain what are the differences and what are the significance of the differences in Perek Aleph and Perek Bet. By the way, just, you know, to, to go back into a historical context, these differences are usually left to the realm of Midrashim to, to deal with. The idea of, of Parshanut and looking closely into every word is something that is a, a later phenomenon. Most of Chazal were involved in basically understanding halacha and how to live as Jews. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week and, and how to read from the text what might be there. But right now we're left with this Adam one, Adam two kind of issue. And, and what are the differences between these aspects of, of humans and humans functioning in the world? And I want to look at the two 20th century, late 19th, 20th century philosophers who really deal with that. One of us is Martin Buber, and the other one is of Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, otherwise known as the Rub. So Martin Buber, and we'll, here's his bio, brief biography on Wikipedia. And here are some pictures. And, and I'm going to like throw this out to the audience. If anybody knows, who this guy is here on the left, if he or she could please let me know because I've done a lot of asking and a lot of looking and have not found the origin of this picture. So I don't know who this is. The reason I chose this image is that I think it is very, very telling that Martin Buber who grew up from, okay, a descendant of the Maharam um, left Orthodox Judaism didn't leave it so completely so that he would not have anything to do with Orthodox Jews because here he is in a picture and definitely in conversation with somebody who's clearly part of the Orthodox community. But Martin Buber grew up in, in Vienna in a, a from household. And when he was seven years old, his parents divorced. Now, I just want to go back and, and look at these dates here. Right? Martin Buber was born in 1878, right? 
for a couple to get divorced in 1885 was a very, very big deal. For a couple to get divorced in 1985 was a big deal. For a couple to get divorced today is still a big deal. But I just want to focus in on this time period here is that he was seven years old when his parents got divorced and this was 1885 and he was sent to live with his grandparents. And it is, it is hypothesized by his biographers that this event traumatized him tremendously, understandably, and was what really set him on his path into understanding the nature, the deep nature of relationships because he saw this foundational relationship in his life disintegrate. Food for thought. Um, again, to me, our, our, our Shanim, our Chazal, our philosophers, at the end of the day, they're human beings and their worldview is impacted by their own psychology and their own experiences. Martin Buber's most famous work, which he wrote in German is Ich du, which is translated into English as I thou. What's important to understand is that in German, like in Latin, like in French, I believe in Russian, but not in English, German has the proper you and the familial or the familiar you, what's known as, let's say, the second person singular, like in French, it would be tu, and the second person plural in French, it would be vu. In, in Hebrew, we talk about the second person and the third person, right? You don't talk to a rav as ata, you refer to him as harav or as harabanit, right? Or as hamelach. It's that third person in, in Britain, we talk about the royal we. So what Martin Buber is exploring the difference between the formal relationship, which he refers to as ich, es, I, it, and the informal relationship, ich, du. And what he posits is that humans interact on two levels. And we really see these two levels in Sefer Breshit, right? And I'm gonna stop the screen share so I can actually see faces for a couple minutes. Um, that what's going on is that when we relate to people, we either relate to them by their title, their position, right? Teacher, boss, um, king, minister, whatever. And, and those positions have rules of engagement that, are, that come along with them. That when we relate to a teacher, we relate in a certain way, when we relate to a king, when we relate to, to a boss, that we don't know each other as people per se, we just know each other in terms of the role that our, the rules, I'm sorry, that our position demands. That's the I, it. The deeper relationship is the I, thou. Right? When, when we get to know each other as individuals, as separate but equal, and that this is what's going on, Bereshit Perek Aleph and Bereshit Perek Bet, that we relate to Hashem as rulers and subjects, or as to the rest of the world as rulers and the animal kingdom as subjects. But in Perek Bet, the, the command, so to speak, is to view one another as ich du, as I thou, to relate to the other as you relate to yourself, the Ahafta Lueha Kamoha. Rav Salavechik describes this in his Lonely Man of Faith as the difference between majestic man and covenantal man. That in Perak Aleph, that the human is in the relationship with Hashem as king, right? we are his servants, right? Malkin, Melech. By the way, please take note that it takes us a whole bunch of words to get to First, we have to get to Baruch Ata Hashem, which is interesting because the Ata and the Hashem show up in Perigbet, 
the Elokinu Melech Olam goes back to Perik Aleph. So what Rav Soloveitchik writes is that what makes us lonely effectively is that even though at the end of the day, we're created Hashem Elohim, that, that human beings, Perik Bet, what he calls as covenantal man or as relational man is, is looking for a relationship with Hashem that we're never gonna completely have that relationship with Hashem because Hashem is always Melech. What's important for us in terms of psychology is that all human relationships, the way that we intersect with other humans basically break down into these two types of relationships. Okay? And, and each of us effectively is a combination of these two aspects of being human. The first aspect, which is the majestic man or the ruling man or the, you know, pru is a very practical, objective, scientific way of intersecting with the world. It's an Elohim type of existence, right? It's, let me figure out how this works. Let me make it better. Let me make it more efficient. It is the scientist in the lab trying to figure out how a virus works, how a cancer works, how light works, how gravity works. Right? It is an economist trying to figure out the rules of money. It is a, an artist trying to imitate accurately what she sees or a musician to convey what she hears, whether it's inside her head or outside. It is, it is a very one-to-one -one practical objective kind of way of intersecting and, and humans have that. We have jobs to do, they need to get done. The other way that we relate to one another though is on this relational way that it's not so much about how does this work and how do I get it done? But it's the what are what's involved here and why. Right? It's that different, it's it's the artist, the impressionist artists who try to convey the essence of light rather than what a field looked like. It's Debussy in his in his composition of Le Mail trying to convey what the ocean is and not just what it sounds like. It's, it's literature trying to convey not just words, but experiences. It's, it's a different way of relating to the world. That is the covenantal relationship. So how does this relate back to psychology? And let's start talking about some psychological theories here. I'm gonna go back into the screen share. Okay, we, we talked about, here's the picture of the Rav, you know, my, my most favorite picture, right? We're gonna get back, we're actually gonna skip Viktor Frankl for the week and we're, we'll come back to it. So the earliest model of how humans, the earliest psychological model, right? of how humans intersect with the world is very much an Adam one type of model. Not surprisingly, it comes out of Vienna, the world where Martin Buber grew, grew up and it comes out of Sigmund Freud. And, and Sigmund Freud is known, and I think correctly so, as the father of psychology. Um, and Sigmund Freud was a physician. So he's going to be looking at, and he was looking at the body as a physician did. And what he noticed and what everybody around him noticed is that there were certain physical conditions that weren't really responding to the normal physical remedies. We now call these psychosomatic illnesses, right? That, that you, yes, you can take medication to treat a migraine. Yes, you can take medication to treat an ulcer. Yes, you can take medication to treat high blood pressure. But if you don't also address 
the underlying issues, whether they're psychological or lifestyle, we call them, usually call them stress, right? That, that underpin these physiological conditions, then the physiological conditions are going to persist. Now, we in the 21st century take this completely and totally for granted. But we have to kind of throw ourselves back to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, where we didn't have the same medical knowledge that we have. We didn't have the same chemical knowledge that we had. We had facts on the ground. But we also had a society where the stresses on women were significantly heavier than the stresses on men. Women had significantly less freedom of movement, freedom of choice, and economic, they had almost no economic freedom, right? So I'm not talking in a postmodern feminist 21st century language. I'm, I'm looking at the facts on the ground here, right? Women were corseted, physically corseted. Um, I remember my grandmother in, 1968, 69, when I was a little girl, asking me to pull the strings tight of her corset. She was still wearing a corset in the late 1960s because it's what she had worn her whole life. And at least the corset that she wore was a cloth corset and not one with, with bone or steel stays that crushed kidneys, livers, ribs, and spines. They have to you know, think about the clothing of the time. Women had no economic freedom. They, they very rarely worked unless they were poor, certainly not the upper middle class and upper class women that Freud was seeing weren't working, but that also meant that they had no economic freedom and they were completely dependent on their husbands or fathers. They had very little choices in terms of what they could do and what they could be. And as the world was opening up in the 1800s and there was some greater mobility and there was this movement, the Marxists, the, you know, the beginnings, the seeds of, of the social revolutions in the mid 1800s, but these social revolutions really applied primarily to men whereas women were, were the ones that were still working in the factories. As, as men were beginning to move into the academic world and universities and move up the social ladder with greater access to education, women were still working in factories and making money. And, and again, well into the 20th century, men would go to college and women wouldn't. And men would go to graduate school and women wouldn't. And to this day, the majority of PhDs, and in terms of you know, research and science, the majority of academic positions are still held by men. And the corona epidemic and the working from home thing has revealed again and again and again how women are still by and large the ones that are responsible for dealing with children. And again, I'm not speaking from a feminist point of view, I'm speaking from an objective disparity point of view. And Freud saw this disparity and the impact that it had on the lives of, of women. And the way Freud described it, again, going back somewhat into the early Greek philosophers is that human beings are comprised of three components. Freud was left his religion behind and Freud was very much anti-religious. And this is what has given Freud very much a bad rap in the religious community throughout the decades because Freud saw religion very much as the communists saw religion as an opiate of the masses and as a vehicle of something that wasn't uplifting but rather as something that was repressive. So Freud explained that human beings are not bodies and souls. He didn't really believe in a soul. Rather, he described humans as an id, an ego, and a superego. And this is, again, very much based in physiology and medicine, that what makes us human are, first and foremost, our physical drives. And for Freud, a lot of that revolved around 
sexual drives. Because again, in, you have to remember the world in which Freud was operating, late 19th century, early 20th century, Victorian mores and the Edwardian era never reached Austria and Germany, right? Austria and Germany went straight from Victorian to World War I. You had this brief blip of freedom in the 1920s, but at the same time you had economic volatility and depression and the Treaty of Versailles and all of this kind of stuff. And then the next thing you knew we had Hitler. So, you know, Austria, Germany is not exactly a, a liberal society, certainly not, not then. Um, and particularly when it came to issues around sexuality. So for Freud, basically humans were about physical and sexual drives. And he referred to those drives as the id, right? We have a drive to eat, we have a drive to drink, but we also have a drive to live, which he, in Latin is the libido, which then gets translated back into the sex drive, not the reproductive drive, but the sex and the sexual pleasure drive, the pleasure principle. Right? That humans are driven by a need to fulfill our desires and fulfill them now. And we'll talk more about that next week when we get into gun again. The superego are the outside forces, the rules, the society, and in its worst form, the religion, right? Whether it's the Catholic church or the synagogue, Freud didn't really know from Muslims so much, but it's the church, and I say the church in, in quotes, right? Because you can either say the church like Catholicism, Protestantism, halacha, right? It is religious rules and society rules that he terms the super ego. What does that mean? They are beyond the ego. The ego is the, the mediating force, what we would call cognition and the real or, or kind of the mature sense of self that goes back and forth between the I want it, I want it now, and I don't care how I'm going to get it. Think about the six month old screaming because she's hungry. The super ego is the voice of society or the voice of religion that says, I'm sorry, you can't have this right now. And the ego is what mediates between the rage of the hungry infant or the rage of the temper tantrum and the seemingly incredibly unfair rules of the outside. So for Freud, we're constantly in a state of conflict between what I want and what society or religion says has to be. Now, by the way, you know, Rav Hirsch was also grappling with the same thing. And for Rav Hirsch, it was, you know, you dress like a modern person outside, but you operate within the framework of halacha, right? This whole concept of modern orthodoxy of the late 19th and into the 20th and 21st century comes out of this same conflict, comes out of the same conflict between how do I deal with my own needs, whether it's for pleasure or to fit in or whatever it is, and the demands of halacha and the demands of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? So for Freud, those demands of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, those demands of religion or those unreasonable demands of society were seen as something bad and had to be kind of pushed to the side for Rav Hirsch and for the Rav and for Rav Cook and for kind of the world in which we operate, we are constantly going back and forth between those needs. And, and to me, that's what Tanakh and psychology or Halakh and psychology is about. It's about that balancing act. So that is, that is how Freud looked at the human and, and looked at the psyche. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second here and just make sure, I'm gonna stop the screen share if I can, um, and like just pause and, and ask 
are there any questions for before we move on? I know I've kind of thrown a lot of information at you so far and just want to take a break. And are there any questions, any comments so far before we move forward? Okay, then, I guess not. All right, so let's let's move forward then. And hit the screen share again. Here we go. Okay, whoops, go back to the doc. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so one of Freud's disciples um, is, sorry about that, we have the little handy dandy little chart. One of Freud's disciples is, is Alfred Adler. Um, Alfred Adler, also born and raised in Vienna, and, and he was a member of Freud's Chabura, because Freud at the end of the day was still a Jew, and he was still raised with this idea of Chavruta and Gemara learning and Talmud and the Talmudic model, and he never really got away from it. He just you know, transferred it into his own world. And Freud had a weekly Chabura. Alfred Adler was part of that Chabura. Carl Jung was part of that Chabura. Eventually his daughter Anna was part of that Chabura. And, and many of the early Freudians were part of his weekly Chabura. Um, and, and over the course of time, there was a lot of tension that came out of that Chabura because obviously Freud felt that his approach was the correct approach. And the younger members, particularly Adler, um, disagreed with him. And, and we know what happens when a Talmud disagrees with a Rav or a child, for that matter, disagrees with a parent, is that eventually that Talmud kind of goes off to found his own yeshiva or the child, very appropriately, goes off to, to found his own life and his own household. And that's exactly what happened with, with Adler. Because for Freud, the intersection between human and reality was something that was, number one, pretty much fixed by the time a child was six years old. You went through the early stages of development, the oral stage, the anal stage, the phallic stage. And by the time you were six years old, you or, were more or less stuck for good and for bad. There was very little change that could happen. And whatever change did happen required years of analysis. And even in the framework of psychoanalysis, there was still very much a power imbalance between physician and patient or analyst and patient, even that language of physician and patient um, conveyed the power imbalance, right? And, and Freud very much took seriously this, this idea that he is the baki, he knows, and, and to some degree, if you disagree with him, then you are resisting, you're wrong, right? Which very ironically is just perpetuating this idea of a rule maker and having to subscribe to those rules. So for Alfred Adler, what was important was not just the state of the individual human and the individual in relation to the society, but the human being in relation to the events and, the, and what's going on at the moment. And Adler is credited very much with what's called relational psychology. His model is the one that impacted the American school system. He and William James were very much of, of a mindset that psychology, theology, philosophy, but also life all intersected with each other. Remember that William James is the father of American pragmatism. He was closely aligned with um, John Dewey, right? Who is the father of American pragmatic education or what we now refer to as experiential education. 
The idea being that humans learn and grow and develop within an environment. It's not just about what's going on inside of me. It's also about what's going on around me. So it's me, right? It's me that, that ha-adam of Perik Bed. But it's also me in relation to you, right? Etzami atzamai bisarmi misari, ish, isha, right? It's a relationship. And in addition, it's the relationship of you and me and the environment in which we are placed. And whether that environment, the original environment is a garden, right? The environment is a, a physical location. It's not just a mental location. It's a physical location into which we are placed and with which we have a relationship, right? So Hashem says, this is your garden, right? You can eat all of the Asev is there for you. You are in relationship with other animals. You can eat those animals. You can use those animals for your benefit, but you are also custodial to them. Right? And you are in a relationship with me, meaning with, with God. Right? So for Adler, and I'm going to go back to the, the sorry, we kind of lost that screen share there for a second. Um, hold on, here we go. Right? That for Adler, what's going on is that, and I love this quote from him, meanings are not derived I'm sorry, meanings are not determined by situations, but are determined by, but we determine ourselves by the meanings we give to situations. In other words, that life and living as a human being is about thinking, is about meaning making, is about intersection with a situation. Right? So Adam and Ishto are placed in a garden. They're placed in a place, right? They give the meaning that is given is to some degree given to them by Hashem, right? Don't eat from the eights, do eat from all of the other eightsim, but they also give meaning to their own situation, right? They view each other as arumim, as devoid of artifice. Naked here means, and, and the fact that arum meaning slide and arom meaning naked, that's a whole Parshanut discussion and we'll get into that a little bit next week and the weeks after. But at the end of Parak Bet, the meaning that humans have given to one another is that we are equal. We are both Naked in the sense of we are without clothing, we are without artifice, we make ourselves completely vulnerable to one another. The lo yiposhashu, and there's no shame. We have nothing to be ashamed of. It's, it's natural. The relationship is, is a natural one. Um, I'm going to go to one more model of, of relationships, which is a late 20th and into 21st century model, which is, is come up which is, uh, I'm sorry, postulated by an American psychologist with the name of Harville Hendricks. And what Hendricks basically does is he combines Freud and Adler. In other words, what he says is as follows. Every human being has a subconscious. Each one of us has an id, an ego, a superego. To put it in the parlance of Breshit, each one of us is ha'adam. Each one of us is physical drives, sexual drives, rulership drives. And each one of us has a superego in the sense of Hashem talking to us. And it's the ego that mediates between that drive to rule and to reproduce and just to be the most powerful individual we can be. And we have a super ego that kind of keeps us in line, whether it's societal rules or religious rules. How, and that's the subconscious relationship. 
and every Zachar and Nikiva that meet up with each other come with that dynamic, come with that unconscious relationship with themselves and the unconscious relationship with the rule makers and the society and, and the confines with which they grew up. Right? Everyone is a Zachar or Nikiva. Everyone has Pru or Revu, Mil Uata Arts, Vikiv Shuva. Okay? This, this combination of Hendrix's model and Rashid is, is mine. Hendrix is writing in terms of the, the marriage. He wrote a book called Getting the Love You Want, a Guide for Couples. It's a relational, it's a relationship model. Actually, I happen to think it's a really good book. Um, and, and Hendrix himself began as a minister. So he has the theological background. He also was married and divorced and is now remarried and together with his wife, have an institute and write and speak. So he's to some degree writing from experience. So in addition to the, the unconscious, right? The Adam one, the Barishi one human is what he refers to as, as the conscious human, is the more sapient human, is the, the human that makes the adult human that makes choices, that really understands what he and she wants and, and how to go about getting it. For example, you have a child who grows up a product of trauma right, of, of whether it's violence, death of a parent, um, external trauma, war, abuse, but choose your trauma, whatever trauma that is, mental, you know, severe mental illness of a parent, severe physical illness of a parent. Childhood grows up in a situation of trauma. What the child knows from the very earliest age, what we as an individual know and is buried in our subconscious is the existence of that trauma and the impact of that trauma. As we get older, hopefully as healthier, older people, we learn how to navigate that world and have that trauma be there, but try to craft a life for ourselves that avoids that trauma. And particularly in the case of a child that grows up either in an abusive environment or a traumatic environment, or have, you know, having dealt with the death of a parent on a conscious level, the child wants to get away from that kind of a painful situation, right? You want stability, you want love, you want health, you want communication, you want predict whatever it is you want. When we find a spouse, very often we're looking for something on a conscious level that is in opposition to what we know and what we're familiar with on an unconscious level. That's what he talks about the conscious and the subconscious relationship. So they're at odds with each other, which is similar to how pru uruvu umilua da'aretz v'kifshuha is at odds with Hashem saying, I'm putting you in this garden, le'ovda u'leshomra, and also you have mitzvot, right? You have mitzvot say that you can eat from the gun, and you have a mitzvot lo ta'asa, that there are certain things that you can't eat from. And that what humans do through the course of their lives is to navigate those two. It's to navigate the conscious and the higher level, right? That which makes us human, our nishamot, our mind, and the, the more base level of what I want. Now, the way the Mepharshim put it, and particularly the Malbim who we did last week, is that all humans are comprised of a goof, which is physical, which has physical drives, the mind and the emotions are actually part of that goof. He writes about it extensively in his introduction to Shir Hashirim. And we are also obviously made of a nishama. 
which is purely divine and is purely spiritual. And in the Malvin's view, and in the Abarbanel's view, and in the Ramban's view, and it goes all the way back into the Gemara, and Arba Nechna Pardes, and Rabbi Akiva, and Ben Azai, and Ben Zoma, and Alicia Ben Avoya, that the conflict is between the body and its needs and desires and drives, and the mind even being part of the body and the soul. So if we kind of take all of this back and we, we go back right to the text um, of Sefer Breshit, hang on, right? We're gonna go, I'm gonna scroll back up to the end of Parak Bet and what the Torah presents to us as that perfect union, right? That perfect fusion. Here we are. What is it that al kein ya'azov ish et aviv imo vidavak beishto vayu levasar echad? In order to be kind of that perfect individual, to some degree, we number one have to leave the child behind. Right? We have to leave the id behind. We have to leave behind the, I want it, I want it now. We, we have to employ the ego. We have to employ the conscious cognitive mind to mediate. In the Torah view though, what is the perfect human? V'davak b'ishto v'hayu l'basar echad v'yiyu shnehem arumim v'lo yitoshashu. These are all of a piece. In the Torah view, the perfect person or the ideal is one where the physical and the metaphysical, the sexual and the spiritual are in harmony with each other. V'davak b'ishto which is for sure spiritual, metaphysical, religious, philosophical, whatever word you want to use. The Hayula Basar Echad, there's no other way to read that. That, that is you know, the beast of two backs. That is a male and a female joined physically, but joined face to face, which again, Zotapa'am, as human beings, even our most animal, physical, sexual drives, which are honored, which are holy, are elevated because we are Azer Kenegdo, because we are face to face, because we see each other, because we are in communication with each other. Because vayihiyu, and the word vayihiyu means a state of being, right? We, we um, go back to Migilat Rut, right? That, that they moved to Moab, Elimelech and his family moved to Moab, vayihiyusha. They were there. They became what Moab was, and then Elimelech died, and then his sons died. But the, this this verb, vayihiyu shnehem, means that that was their state of being. Arumim is not a verb, arumim is the modifier. Vayihiyu here is the verb. What were they? They were. They were in perfect harmony. How were they? They were arumim. They were completely revealed to one another. Because when there's nothing dividing you, when you are together, there's nothing between you. When we are together with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, it's a state of nivu'ah. It's a perfect union. It's body and soul. Velo yit poshash. There was no shame. There was nothing. There was no busha. There was nothing that was negative about it. So whereas in, in the view of modern psychology, there has to be a tension between body and mind, body and soul, body and religion, self and other. In Judaism, the ideal to which we aspire is 
you know, Ish, Isha, and Hashem. That's why, why the Gemara talks about that, that in every marriage, there is a man, a woman, and God. And that if we take the words, and this is very Hasidic um, or Midrashic or Kabbalistic, that, you know, between Ish and Isha, right, there's the Yud and the He, that when Ish and Isha come together, that there's Shem Hashem. When Hashem and when the spiritual is removed from Ish and Isha, all you have is Ish and Ish Ochla. Right? So from, from the Torah perspective, we have this division of elements, but from a Torah perspective, they don't have to be divided. Now, what we're going to talk about next week is what happened in Gan Eden, what kind of went wrong, and how we moved through this kind of perfect moment in time, and then things just started to disintegrate, and, and we became the beings that we very much are today. So we're going to stop here, and again, um, any questions, comments, we have a couple minutes, I think. Yep, we have like three minutes before, three, four minutes before the end of class. So if anybody would like to, you know, unmute themselves, yes. have a question, make a comment. Could we go back to Adam and Chava for a minute? I wondered what Adam gave up in the creation of Chava. Selfishness. Right? In some ways, it's much easier to, you don't have to negotiate, you don't have to compromise. Everything gets to be your way and the way you want it. And, and if you have a work partner, then if you are in a superior position to that work partner, then you get to order them around. If you are equal position to that work partner, then you both have the same goal and the job gets done. But there's no investment. There's no emotional investment. And, and in some ways that is easier. That's the, that's the position of the misanthrope is that, it's, you know, being in relationships is just way too complicated and painful. Why should I bother? So in the creation of Chava, when, who by the way, isn't named Chava until after the Chait of the Eights, mm -hmm. that Adam recognizes there is another person out there that has the same rights and the same needs as I do. And if I respect my rights and my needs, and I want my rights and needs to be met, then I need to respect and meet the needs of the other. And then we you know, go back to because at the end of the day, we're selfish. We want to survive. That's embedded in our DNA. So when we encounter another, we have to remove a piece of ourselves, right? Adam lost something. But mm -hmm. a little bit, in, he effectively makes room for the other. And, and the way the Mepharshim look at it is it's not so much as male and female, it's, it's, or man and woman. It, it's more, particularly the way Rob Soloveitchik writes it, it's, it's about one and the other, right? It's not, there are no gender roles yet. There are two human beings two who, are working, who are both working together, but also who are now in a relationship with one another. Thank you. Okay, any other mm -hmm. questions or comments? Okay then. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope everybody has a great day and I look forward to seeing everybody next week. So do and we. Questions, please feel free to email or, you know, and uh, Matan has my email, my phone number. Feel free to reach out in whatever way possible. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Good luck.